started to began his his career in the area of mental health and the law, also another sort of leadership topic we could have had to deal with. And he's had various academic positions in psychology, education, and in social science programs in various uh, leading US universities. He then worked at the National Center for State Courts, with whom we have an MOU, and uh, both as the director of the Institute of Mental Disability in the law, and then eventually as the director of the Institute of Court Management, and eventually served as vice president of that center. He established an international consultancy business called Court Metrics, and until last year, he was senior justice reform specialist at the World Bank. As a researcher, consultant for public, not for profit, and private sector throughout the world, Professor Kyletz has helped shape the landscape of justice system governance, administration, and reform in places like Hong Kong, Macedonia, Trinidad and Tobago, Kosovo, Jamaica, Moldova, Saudi Arabia, Serbia, and South Africa, and most recently with the World Bank in Kenya and Afghanistan. He's now in Melbourne, and we keep having to assure him that he's not going to be shot at, <laughs> mostly, um, and that he's quite safe. Um, Professor Kyletz will address us on uh, the topic, as you know, delicate balance, judicial independence, self-management, transparency, and public accountability. And each of those words is a thought leadership topic in its own right. Can I introduce to you Professor Kyletz? Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, distinguished guests, um, dear colleagues, friends, students, I understand there are a few of those here. Welcome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I bid you good evening. Uh, please know that I consider this a uh, distinct honor and a pleasure to be addressing you tonight, so thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, this evening, spend about 30 minutes and engaging you in, in, in thinking about and exploring what I consider to be a relatively new element, a new component of, of governance of the courts. Now, you all know that, that the idea of modern management techniques being injected into the governance of courts is not necessarily a new idea. I think this is an element, a relatively new element. Uh, that has increasingly been grafted into the meaning and the practice of, of judiciaries throughout the world in their, their, their meaning, their understanding, their practice of judicial independence. And namely, that is uh, rigorous performance measurement and management as the mechanism for, for accountability and for transparency. Now, you, know, you all know that the idea that judiciaries should be kept apart from uh, and away from undue influences of the other sectors of government, uh, that is not something new. Uh, that's certainly something that many ju the judiciaries are trying to achieve throughout the world. And as you know, judicial independence is integral and important and critical to the, to the concepts of, of uh, separation of powers and the, the balance of, of powers in government. Now, I firmly believe, and this is probably the message that I want to give you, that accountability and, and, and transparency, public openness, strengthens, does not weaken judicial independence. Uh, if, and this is very important, if that the mechanism for that performance measurement for that performance management is wholly owned by the courts. And, uh, and when they ask themselves, how are we doing? Uh, and, and I think that's an important question as the courts try to get to this very delicate balance between independence and, and uh, public accountability. Uh, I'll have a, I, and, and to ask this question, how are we doing in full public view? And I have a little bit more to say about that in a bit. At first blush, you might think that the, the concept of independence, judicial independence on one hand, and, and public accountability on the other are rather odd bedfellows, incompatible goals. Um, clearly, there's resistance to this notion of bringing these two things together in some circles, in some judiciaries. 
Um, if you suggest that, that suggesting that accountability and independence are odd, bad bedfellows would be considered a vast understatement in many judiciaries around the world, uh, uh, especially when implemented by, by rigorous performance measurement and management in full public view. Uh, the argument is that the very idea, the very idea of, of accountability <laughs> and transparency is an antithesis of the very idea of judicial independence and separation of powers. This argument rests, however, I think, on what I believe may be a false assumption. And that false assumption is that the mechanism of accountability and transparency and uh, driven by performance measurement is necessarily imposed on the courts by external forces. And I think that's, that's, not, uh, that's not necessarily a, a valid assumption. I will argue that public accountability driven by a system of performance measurement and management, if it is wholly owned by the courts, uh, will strengthen the institutional integrity of courts and strengthen judicial independence. Uh, I'm going to share with you two examples of that, uh, one from a relatively small court, one one level of court, the Supreme Court, and then another example, both from the United States, of an of entire court system. Uh, but before I proceed, however, let me, let me uh, acknowledge a couple of debts of gratitude um, and give my thanks to uh, the Courts and Tribunal Academy at the Sir Gelman Cowan Center mm -hmm. here at the Victoria University, and, and especially to Kathy Laster uh, for making it possible for me to be here tonight. And also, uh, I want to acknowledge the financial support of the, the, uh, uh, the Fulbright Scholar Program that made it also possible for me to be there. Finally, I want to thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, the, the hallmark, in my view, the hallmark of a successful organization, an excellent organization, an excellent one, is the capacity and the political will to ask the question, how are we doing? Um, on a regular basis. It's the difference between a successful court and an unsuccessful court. The capacity, the willingness to, to analyze, to gather, to use performance data, and then, to you, and then to look at that data and see what kind of insights and understanding it would give to be able to, uh, uh, to govern the courts in a responsible, accountable, and, and, and transparent manner. We all expect our governments to provide services, do we not? Uh, I think that's a reasonable expectation that citizens have, including judicial services, um, uh, to be responsive, to be open, to be accountable, to be honest. Uh, this expectation, I think, I believe, is raised for courts. And why? Uh, I think it's raised for courts because more than any other entity in government, it is, there is an expectation, a, a common belief, that they, more than any other entity in government, should practice what is preached in the laws and the regulations that they are beholden to enforce and the ones that govern us all. Think about it. What institutions should be the ones that, that, that uh, 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 should practice what they're preaching, and I think it's the courts. Uh, in their deliberations, in their decisions, in their actions, we expect judges to, to look at the facts, to look at the data, if you will. Um, uh, we expect judges to treat people that come before them with dignity and respect. We expect them uh, to give the people that come before them their day in court. And in the jargon of academics, we expect the courts to give the people that come before them voice. We expect them to give them agency. We expect them to provide procedural justice and procedural fairness. So what might be the requirements of this delicate balance between judicial independence and uh, 
and, and, and uh, accountability look like in practice? How would the leadership of a single institution or the leadership of an entire court system uh, demonstrate the political will and the capacity to ask itself and to address the question very forthrightly, how are we doing? Uh, and thereby exhibiting independence and its legitimate authority to manage its own affairs. How would that look like in practice? And not wait for some external en entity to answer that question for them. And many judiciaries in the world are in that position. Waiting first for some external entity, and it could be the media, it could be uh, the executive, it could be the legislature. So let's first look at a single court, uh, the Supreme Court of uh, Montana. And this is really a success story of Michael McGrath. It's the guy that, uh, where the arrow is pointing to. Uh, McGrath, uh, he's the Chief Justice of the state of Montana. McGrath was elected to an eight-year term as Chief Justice uh, uh, in Montana in 2008. And uh, the few of you that don't know this, but in many states in the US, uh, judges, Supreme Court judges are elected. Uh, when he took office early in 2009, there was a general sentiment among uh, uh, people in Montana, uh, which I think uh, I understand from talking to him, although he didn't quite say it quite as, as bluntly, that he shared that sentiment uh, before he took the bench when he was the attorney general and when he was an appellate lawyer in Montana. That he shared the sentiment that the courts, the Supreme Court was not uh, handling its cases in an efficient manner. That was taking much too long to get through the court system. Um, uh, which was damaging the reputation of the court. McGrath had inherited an organizational performance measurement system from its predecessor, uh, Chief Justice Carla Gray, about which he was a little bit skeptical. Uh, it's important to point out that the system that McGrath inherited uh, is the appellate version of the court tools, which was the basis and the model for the global measures of court performance, which are part of the International Framework for Court Excellence, which was adopted by the Victoria Courts under the leadership of, of Chief Justice Marilyn Warren. And I want to praise her. I think she deserves praise. And I want to commend her and her, uh, her, her leadership uh, team for paving the way for establishing a rigorous self-managed uh, system of accountability uh, based on the international framework and based on the global measures of court performance. Okay, back to uh, Chief Justice McGrath. Uh, despite his initial skepticism about the court performance measures system, his attention was drawn to, to one particular measure, and he called it the consumer satisfaction measure. He's, he's dropped that notion of consumer since then, but it's the appellate version of measure number one of the global measures, uh, court user satisfaction. The percentage of court users, the people that are actually using the courts, not people out in the public who have not had contact with the courts, who believe that the court provides procedural justice, accessible, fair, accurate, timely, knowledgeable, and et cetera. Uh, uh, the measure has been taken, and, and so, so this measure, uh, McGrath was very interested in, asked the question, uh, uh, are it, is the Supreme Court of Montana, are they really managing their cases in an expeditious and timely manner? Uh, the measure has been taken in, in Montana every two years since 2008. Uh, it uses an inexpensive anonymous survey, and this is very important. The survey is designed by the courts, it's analyzed by the courts, it's used by the courts, and the courts control it. That's a very important uh, thing to remember. The survey asked about 1,000 appellate court uh, uh, attorneys. Trial court judges at first instance who's had cases before the Supreme Court within a foreseeable future, and a handful of, of law professors asked the question, does the court, the Supreme Court, handle its caseload in an expeditious and, and timely manner? Respondents rated the courts on several important, several core areas, including whether the court decisions are based on facts 
and applicable, applicable law, whether the court's published opinions explain any kind of deviations from the law, and whether the courts treats lower judges with courtesy and respect instead of disdain. There were some rumors that that was in fact occurring in, in Montana. Uh, they also surveyed, uh, asked the courts uh, about the court's timeliness and expedition in completing its, its cases. In 2008, among all the items of the survey, uh, this item is where the court's performance was the lowest. Uh, less than one-third, one in three of the respondents, thought that the court was handling its cases in an expeditious and timely manner. This bothered Chief Justice uh, McGrath, as it would everyone in this room. Uh, after all, as I say, justice delayed is justice denied. So uh, he decided to do something about it. He uh, mobilized his fellow justices on the Supreme Court and the staff of the Administrative Office of the Courts. Uh, let me point out that he did not have to, uh, Montana is an independent judiciary. So there was no problem with him mobilizing uh, the very competent staff from the, from the court services. So they joined him and tried to do, to do something. And they proceeded uh, rather simply by first taking uh, a very hard look at the kinds of cases that were coming uh, through the court and how the court was handling the demand. And as a result, what they found, they instituted, immediately instituted a number of simple, straightforward procedures. Number one, they increased the number of short, what they called memo uh, opinions relative to the, the standard opinions that they normally issued. So they increased the number of short opinions, which of course saved time. They shortened the standard time for regular uh, opinions and also shortened the standard uh, length, I'm sorry, for, for dissents. Uh, they tightened the time limits on receipt of appellate briefs. And they also stayed and complied with the rules for the appellate briefs. They were kind of uh, loose about that and let, let attorneys uh, slip and not send in their, their briefs on time. So they tightened that, they tightened the timelines and also uh, 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 enforced the timelines. And this was important, they instituted procedures where they came to the aid of justices in the courts that were, were having trouble keeping up with the writing of their opinions. And this was done in a very collegial way this is not done in the open to say, you know, you are slow, et cetera. This was, you know, and, and now all these were reasonable common sense measures that, that the bar, the bench, and the public agreed with and actually welcomed. You know, no controversy in this at this stage. Uh, uh, everyone got on board to put these uh, uh, improvements into place. Now McGrath and the other members of the, the, the court were convinced and I was with them at the time, were convinced that this, these measures are going to bear fruit. But they were smart enough to know it really didn't matter what they thought, the people who ran the courts, what really mattered, what did the people who were on the receiving end, excuse me, the receiving end of these judicial services really think. Uh, in September 2010, less than two years after McGrath took office, the Supreme Court conducted its second survey. And as you can see here, the percent of respondents who believed that the court was handling its caseload and processing its cases in an expeditious and timely manner uh, increased a whopping 50 percent. And this is less than about a year and a half after, after he took office. Now these are pretty dramatic results from one in three people to four out of the five people. Uh, and, and this reverberated through the system. Quite amazingly, at least to me, when they did the survey again two years later in 2014, that percentage shot up to 94.5 percent. Remember, over a short period of time, we've gone from one to three people, one out of three people thinking that the court was performing well in, in the expedition and timeliness of processing cases to 19 out of 20 cases. Uh, and incidentally, the performance, the other performances, this increase, this tremendous increase in their performance on expedition and timeliness did not come at a price of a decrease in the other performances. The other performances stayed at a fairly high level. Montana now makes this information publicly available on their website. And let's take a quick peek at that. 
Um, I'm going to the web now. This is live. Uh, and as you can see here, they, the, the bar bench survey that I was just talking about, uh, if you clicked on there, you can see the detail of that, and I won't go through it. They also do what's called an employee engagement survey, and this is a survey based upon uh, extensive research by the Gallup Corporation uh, to as, this is a proxy for the health of an organization. And it's, uh, it, it asks the question, to what degree are the staff is the staff of, an org of, of the Supreme Court uh, and the rest of the court system, to what degree are they willing to use the discretionary time and energy uh, for the mission of the court? And so that's a proxy for the health of, of, of a court system. They also make available the kinds of case processing uh, measures that you're all familiar with. And here is the last quarter in 2015, clearance rate, manner of dispositions, age of pending cases. My point is they make, not only do they take this measure, but they willingly make this uh, publicly available. Anyone can get to this. And there's more detail here. Let's, take a, let's take a look at an, another uh, uh, example. And this is in the state of Utah. Um, a dozen years ago, in 2004, uh, the Utah Judicial Council, which is the governing body for the Utah uh, court system, uh, began implementing a court performance measurement system that's again very similar to the global measures of court performance that, that have adopted here in the Victoria Courts. The system was championed by two individuals that are pictured here uh, who are thought leaders in, in, in the U.S. for quite some time and, and somewhat internationally. Uh, the former Chief Justice Christine Durham and the current State Court Administrator Dan uh, Becker, uh, Daniel Becker. Both of them received, in successive years, received a rather prestigious award for judicial excellence named after the Chief Justices, the U.S. Chief Justices, Warren E. Berger and William H. Rehnquist. And the award is given for recognizing leadership and governance of the judiciary based on transparency and accountability through rigorous performance measurement. Uh, in an influential, very influential paper uh, uh, on unifying principles and governance, uh, that came out of the Harvard Kennedy School of, Governance, uh, of Government uh, Leadership Series, uh, uh, which got a lot of attention in the U.S. and nationally. The Chief Justice Durham and Becker urged his colleagues in the U.S. and around the world to commit to transparency and accountability, recognizing full well that the right to institutional independence and self-governance necessarily entails entails an obligation uh, to be open, accountable to the use of public resources. Not just a matter of the budget and finances and human and, and uh, capital resources, but, but basically the efficient and effective use uh, of, of public funds. Uh, they wrote, and I quote, we in the courts should know exactly how productive we are how well we are serving the public needs and what part of our system and services need attention um, and improvement, they wrote. Moreover, we should make that knowledge a matter of public record. So let's take a look at the kinds of things that they do make very public and go to their website. And here you see the same uh, uh, page, uh, the image that I just had up there. This is live now, and as you can see, uh, uh, it gives a little background. Again, not too much information. You have to dig down to get it. It's interactive. Notice that there are seven uh, measures, and they're very close to the ones in the Global Measures of Court Performance. Uh, um, and notice also that on the bottom there, they have the mission for the court. Make it very clear to provide people an open, fair, efficient, and independent system for the advancements of justice under law. And it suggests that there needs to be an alignment of these measures with the mission. If you don't have that alignment, then you're really not doing the things that you're, you know, it, it measures have got, you've got to count what counts. So there has to be a linkage and alignment with measures and values. Uh, this is interactive, so uh, the clearance rate, for example, you have a very clear definition here that everybody can understand. And notice you don't have to be a lawyer to understand. This is not Latin. Uh, you know, when people get on it, they understand it. Basically. You know, the number of cases being completed or disposed as a percentage of the court cases being filed. The you know, number of cases that go out as a proportion of the cases that go in. It's as simple as that. If you click on that, you see the clearance rate 
uh, starting here with the district courts. So, um, and, you know, so you can see in the district courts here you have the clearance rate ranging across seven case types. And as you can see, the lowest is 86. That would be a warning. I'd say, you know, let's watch that because, you know, over the years that's contributing to a backlog, so we've got to watch that. Uh, you can also click on the different courts, the juvenile court, the justice court, the supreme court, the appeals court. And then if you want to go a little further, uh, down on the bottom here, it, it also gives you a little bit of insight of what the clearance rate is, what is it, how is it measured, why it's important. Again, please understand that this is driven by the court. This is totally, absolutely owned by the court. Uh, and uh, again, if you see more details, uh, you can go right to the, all, the, all the courts and see the percentage of the clearance rate. I wish they had done, actually put the actual numbers in and out in there. At one time they had that in there, and so I would improve it by, by having the actual numbers in it so we can see that. You get the picture. Uh, okay, so uh, in their governance of the, of the Utah court system, Chief Justice Durham and Dan Becker recognize that this balance that we're talking about of independence and public accountability is delicate and, and the demands, uh, the demands are, are, are something that, that are going to be a challenge no matter what. It's going to continue to be. Uh, another important unifying principle that they talked about that they expressed in their Harvard paper and that they actually put into practice every day, and I've seen them do it, is, is exercising the principle of comity, and that is positive institutional relationships uh, with the other branches of government and other sectors of society. Very, very important. Uh, they know that judiciaries must, must work constantly to explain themselves to the other branches of government, and the jurists and the, and the judges in the room know that. Uh, it's a continuous... Uh, uh, issue, they, the courts need to explain themselves and what they're all about to other sectors of, of the government. Uh, they know that court leaders must build relationships, strong personal relationships when there are in conversations and negotiations with other sectors of, of government. The bottom line is that legislative and executive staff as well as their bosses, governors, uh, legislators need to, to know that they can take the information that the courts provide to them to the bank as a single version of the truth in terms of, uh, in terms of accuracy, in terms of timeliness, in terms of transparency. Now this whole idea, and I'm getting to the close of this, the, the, this whole idea of the, the, the principles of, of, uh, of, of comity and the balance between independence and accountability stem from, uh, can be traced to the seminal trial court performance standards uh, system widely disseminated in the U.S. in the mid-1990s or so, and then it was spread around the world uh, thereafter. The TCPS, as it's known, and I know people in Australia like abbreviations, so TCPS, as it's known, is a predecessor of the court tools, as well as the international framework for, for court excellence and the global measures of court performance. Uh, the first two standards of the TCPS in the performance area are uh, set to stage. Judicial independence and separation of powers does not mean isolation. It cannot mean isolation. The whole meaning of checks and balances suggests comity. Uh, uh, courts need to maintain their institutional integrity, yes. Uh, court need, courts need to vigorously protect their institutional boundaries, yes. They need to continually strengthen their ins institutional independence, yes. But at the same time, uh, they need to observe this principle of comity uh, in government regulations. In various policy statements and, and resolutions, the U.S. state uh, court leaders in the Conference of, of, of Chief Justices and the Conference of State Court Administrators that were incidentally led by uh, Justice Dorham and, and, and Becker for quite some time, have linked independence and accountability with organizational performance measurement. With their joint resolution number 14, uh, adopted in 2005, the conferences uh, 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 joined independence and accountability by recognizing that accountability uh, uh, fosters an environment where legislators uh, executive agencies and the public understand the judiciary's role 
and are less likely to interfere with the judiciary's ability to govern itself. Uh, the conference resolved in 2005, and I quote, judiciaries need performance standards and measures that provide a balanced view of court performance in terms of prompt and efficient case administration, public access and service, and fairness and effective, uh, efficient manner. Let me just say that in my experience, serious judicial reform like um, an initiative like introducing the discipline of self-management, what is being proposed here in Victoria, uh, really requires three things. It requires three stars to align. Uh, you need the right idea, you need a good idea, and I quite frankly think that the, that the uh, global measures of court performance and the entire framework of international framework of, of court excellence is the right idea, is a good idea. You need the right people willing to execute that idea. And I think I see that happening here in Victoria. Uh, at least the time that I've been there, I've seen some excitement of people. Uh, obviously, the, 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 there's a commitment at the top. Uh, Chief J uh, Justice Warren has expressed it, and I've noticed a lot of excitement at, at at the execution level in various uh, courts. So I think the, 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 there are, we have the right people willing and able to execute, and finally the right time. Now that's a trick. Uh, in my experience, uh, these stars seldom align. And, and when they do align, they don't align for a very long time. There's something that happens to disrupt that alignment, uh, some kind of hiccup in the, in the transformation to a global economy, uh, some kind of financial crisis or change in priorities and something upsets that alignment. I'm convinced, and I want to leave you with this, that uh, today the stars are aligned here in, in Victoria for uh, the, the court system in Victoria to, to assume responsibility for self-management and to cement its institutional integrity and to strengthen its independence. Thank you very much.